Hey folks, welcome to another episode of Filmography Club. I'm Jason, I'm your host. Today we continue our exploration of the work of Denis Villeneuve, French-Canadian filmmaker extraordinaire, and we're talking about his third English-language film, Sicario, the 2015 thriller starring Emily Blunt, Benicio Del Toro, and Josh Brolin, cinematography by the esteemed Roger Deakins, written by Taylor Sheridan, and with music by the late great Johan Johansson. Sicario is, on its surface, an action thriller set on the Mexican-American border with the expected amount of gritty violence that you would expect to see there, but look a little bit deeper and you'll find a subtle story about corruption and clueless bureaucracy and an exploration of moral absolutism and the cycles of violence that spin out of all of that. My guest today is Jill Townsend. Jill is a singer, songwriter, multi-instrumentalist, a graphic designer, a dedicated film fan. She releases music under the name Fetching Pails, and her debut album, Telekinesis for Beginners, is a mixture of pop, electronic, and art rock, and it's fantastic. Her live shows have a flair for the dramatic, influenced by classic films, horror movies, and the live theatrics of Kate Bush. Be aware, as always, Filmography Club is not a spoiler-free zone. We get into spoilery territory fairly quickly, so be aware of that. So here it is. Here's my talk with Jill Townsend about the 2015 thriller, Sicario. And I'm joined by Jill Townsend. Jill, how are you? I'm good. Doing well. Good, good. I'm glad to have you on. You know what you'd like, so uh, I thought you'd be a good guest on the show. So thanks for coming. Thanks for your time. Thank you for having me. Yeah, so uh, Sicario, first off, tell me, uh, are you familiar with Denis Villeneuve? Uh, when you asked me about this, I I didn't realize I actually had seen some of his movies. I didn't know him by name. Um, I had seen you know, Arrival and the new Blade Runner and also Enemy. Um, I had watched that a few years ago and really liked it. So I, um, I went back and watched that again recently in Prisoners, which I hadn't seen before. So, uh, so yeah, I've, I've got a better grasp on him now. Obviously, I'm doing a whole season on the guy's work. Obviously, I'm a big fan. This is one of his movies that, I mean, this is like if you just had a checklist of Denis Villeneuve, I don't want to say tropes, but I, I guess that, mm-hmm. that works. Just uh, this one just checks pretty much all those boxes. This is like yeah. an out of the box Denis Villeneuve movie. Yeah, yeah. So we've got a. Uh, well, let's see. Where should what should we get into first? This movie is actually because I had rewatched Enemy recently and Prisoners, and I listened to your episodes about those two movies. It's this is a little bit trickier for, or harder for me to talk about this movie. Um, I think I would have had so much more to say about the previous two because this one is so um, it's more straightforward, you know, realistic in a lot of ways, you know, where I was spending time, like thinking, you know, watching those previous two movies, I spent a lot of time thinking, you know, Oh, is there a supernatural element to this? You know, trying to figure all these things out And this movie didn't really have that, you know, um, it was more like I was spending that mental energy, just trying to like keep up with, okay, so the DOJ and the DOD, the FBI is under which, and what are the what is this jargon they're using and stuff like that? Lots of bureaucracy, yeah, a lot of a lot of red tape. Yeah, yeah. It took me kind of just hell. I had to kind of skim the Wikipedia article before my most recent rewatch just uh-huh. to sort of <clears throat> excuse me, just to sort of suss out who works for whom and in what capacity. It's all very vague, and I think some of that's. Right somewhat intentional part of the story we follow kate emily blunt's character for most of the story she seems like she's our protagonist i'm going to argue that she's not really Mm -hmm. in a little bit but we'll get there so for most of the movie she seems like she's our protagonist and she's full of questions almost every scene is what are we doing here who is that guy who does that guy work for is this legal how are we getting Mm -hmm. away with this why where are we she's constantly asking questions on behalf of the audience of course but she's completely totally in over her head in this movie Mm -hmm. and i I think that we're kind of supposed to be along for that ride with her We're, we're supposed to share that that confusion that uncertainty about right yeah i agree with that i feel like i mean we are her like she's the viewer there I felt like, I don't remember at what part in the movie, I felt like there was a lot of, it was a lot of transportation. There were lots of, there was a lot of time spent on them just getting to places and like the helicopter and a lot of time spent in cars, just hers. She's just a passenger, you know, and I kind of feel like she's just along for the ride. And that's kind of, we're asking the same questions that she's asking. 
I guess we need to unpack a little bit about what the story is about. We're not going to go through it beat by beat, of course, but Kate plays and excuse me, Emily Blunt plays uh, a character named Kate Macer. She's an FBI agent. She's uh, she leads a team of um, special response type guys, like sort of SWAT type guys. And she has a very old fashioned sense of morality. I suppose everything is black and white to her. There's good over here and there's bad guys over there. And that's just how things are. And we, we see that example in just her dialogue at the beginning after the raid at the house and right before the explosion happens when someone says, hey, the press is asking questions. What do I tell them? And just without hesitation, the yeah. truth. She just says the yeah. truth. And that is sort of the mirror image of something that happens at the end where we realize that mm-hmm. she, or she realizes that things maybe aren't so black and white. This is a movie that sort of revels in duality, but also just shades of gray. I think the color palette was very mm-hmm. much always the color palette is very intentional in, in Villeneuve's mm-hmm. movies, but this one's very desert, very gray, very dry, a lot of beige. <laughs> lot of beige and it's, it's a very neutral color mm-hmm. later in the movie. When we get that, that scene at the end with Alejandro in her apartment, when he makes her sign the, the piece of paper, you'll notice that the shots of her, it's very white. The background is a white bare wall of her apartment. And then when we get the reverse shot of Alejandro, he's just black. He's just sitting in shadows. Yeah. And it, yeah. Just very little, very little lighting on him. Yeah. It's all very, very intentional. The use of color. here, Right. Yeah. And even, um, you know, the clothes they're wearing, like she's wearing blue and her partner's wearing blue a lot. That's right. That's at the beginning though. Uh huh. Yeah. And then that changes over time and they're, they're wearing beige most of the time, mm-hmm. yeah. except when they have to appear to be official in some way, then they have some blue on. But yeah, yeah, that's not something I noticed the first time, but mm-hmm. yeah, same here. I've seen this maybe probably three times now and I got mm-hmm. way more out of it this time, I think, because I've just done a little bit of research and dug right. around a little bit and had things pointed out to me. Yeah, basically. yeah, yeah. And it was sure enough, I caught it. And the ending sequence, I didn't quite grasp the importance of of what was happening in that very last shot with the little boy playing soccer, Silvio's kid. Yeah. I know that I'm all over the place with this right now, but it, I'm really not concerned so much with the plot <laughs> so much yeah. as I am with the mechanics of right, how they, yeah. they communicate it. Yeah. That's how, that's how my mind is working right now too. Not in a very linear way. I'm just, yeah. think different things are popping up. But uh, concerning the plot, just to unpack that a little bit, it's almost on its surface anyway, it's, this isn't really stuff that hasn't been done before. They don't really right. break new ground plot wise. It's just that it's just such a well written, well acted, and meticulously directed movie. Yes. And there's more to it under that. Like with a lot of the news movies, you can just appreciate the narrative as it is. Mm-hmm. And then once you dig a little bit deeper, I I had no idea that this movie had so much going on, but it it certainly does. And honestly, it's not the kind of movie you know. When you asked if I would talk about this one, I like went to click on it and I read, you know, the synopsis. I was like, okay, this is not a movie I would ever just on my own watch because, and when I watched it for the first time, my husband was with me, which was actually helpful because I was like, what's a spook? And he's like, oh, that's like black ops. And like, what's the, you know, and it's like, just not the subject matter is not the type of thing that to typically draw me in, but I am really glad that I watched it. And yeah, you're totally right about it. On the surface, it seems like a pretty straightforward movie, but yeah, you can watch it again. You can kind of dig a little bit deeper. Um, You were talking about the ending uh, and I was thinking back to Alejandro, you know, he kind of speaks and uh, he's kind of cryptic and yeah. And in the beginning, he said something to her that said, um, nothing will make sense to your American ears. And you will doubt everything that we do. But in the end, you will understand. Nothing will make sense to your American ears. You will doubt everything we do, but in the end, you will understand. And that's like exactly what happened. <laughs> that's exactly what happened. Yeah. yeah. He he called his he called his play and, and sure right. enough, it it, yeah. it happened by the end of it. And I thought on the first couple of viewings that the ending was sort of ambiguous and we were supposed to be left kind of to choose our own idea mm-hmm. of what was going on. And what I'm talking about is after he leaves the apartment, after putting a gun to her head and forcing mm-hmm. her to sign that piece of paper, when she goes out to the balcony and draws a gun on him in the parking lot, that's the sequence I'm talking about. Mm-hmm. And okay. I think in that moment, that's the moment when she realizes that things are not black and white, that there are shades of gray and that he was kind of right. Um, yeah. I feel like he was the protagonist of this movie, the the titular Sicario. Mm-hmm. He he is that that assassin. Yes. 
that yeah. hitman. And much like most Morgan Freeman movies from the 90s, I suppose the movie is about that guy and not the person who you think it's about. Uh, Shawshank Redemption's not about Andy Dufresne. It's about Red. Yeah. yeah. Seven was not about Detective Mills. It was about Detective Somerset the whole time. He's the mm-hmm. one with the arc. And that's, I think, what we get here, except his arc has already happened. Alejandro has already been through things. He's already started out as one thing and wound mm-hmm. up as another. Um, yeah. And the scene where he says to her, you remind me of someone who was precious to me or something like that. Mm-hmm. I immediately assumed a daughter or wife. Yeah. I think he met himself. Oh, you're right. I think he I was, met him yeah. before what happened to his family happened. Yeah, I didn't. That didn't even occur to me. But yeah, I was thinking daughter, maybe your wife. But yeah, I bet you're right because it's like they're you know she's just they're on the same path. He, she's he's just further along. And I think I mean, and what this movie deals with a lot is that whole um, questioning morality and does the end justify the means and um, are things black and white or are there shades of gray? And, and I think in the end, you're sort of left. I mean, I kind of see her as us, like the viewer, and maybe you're questioning those things too. Um, and you're sort of left wondering whether she will, uh, like you said, I think, go work in a small town where the law is still the law or something. I have um, the quote or, right here. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. You should move to a small town where the rule of law still exists. You are not a wolf and this is the land of wolves now. Right. And I think you're kind of left wondering, you know, is she going to do that or is she, has she, does she see things in a new way now? And she's going to adapt to the current, you know, landscape. Did she in fact change? Uh, I think her putting the gun away and deciding to not fire was her way of communicating that, nope, I still, God, I don't know. <laughs> yeah, you can really look at it in know. two ways. Like, yeah, yeah, like I, the, the way that you mentioned before, or is she like, well, no, I can't do that because it's not by the book. I can't just shoot this guy. Yeah, when I really said know. that a few moments ago, I was totally convinced, but now I'm, yeah. I'm, I'm not quite yeah. convinced. She pointed that gun but couldn't fire, and it's for one of two reasons. She either doesn't want to become a killer like him. Yeah. And he does not want that for her either, which is why he says you should move to a small town where the rule of law still exists. Or she does it because she realizes that his tactics are actually correct and they are effective. And the only way she was just barely scratching the surface on the American side of the border, Mm -hmm. like the bureaucrat told her, we've prosecuted in the last year more than we did, you know, the three years combined before that. Do you feel that on the street? And she had to admit, no, not really. Like, if you want to make a real change, we're going to go after the people responsible for what happened at that safe house, the people who are truly responsible for it. And she tries all along, you know, the way to, you know, do things by the book. And when she tries to prosecute him uh, when they. uh, Right. The bank and the. the, Yeah. Mm hmm. The Discover's bank account. And uh, I don't, do you think that when she finally realized that that wasn't going to cut it, do you think that was um, in the end when she found out who Alejandro really worked for and about what happened to his wife and daughter? I don't know. I don't know if the movie really lays it bare. Yeah. I love ambiguity like this. There's a part of my brain that really wants a definitive answer here. Yeah. But I love a movie like this that doesn't just hand it to you. Yeah, it's, I have to wrestle with it. And even after the third viewing, you know, from moment to moment, I'm, I'm convinced that one interpretation is correct. But then in the next, I'm not mm-hmm. I'm not so sure. Kate believes that the ends do not justify the means. She's the only person. I say the only person we haven't even talked about uh, Josh Brolin's character yet. Mm-hmm. But between her and uh, Alejandro, she's she's the one that still has most of her humanity still right. intact. And you have to sympathize with what happened to his family. All right. We get a little bit of backstory on the guy. He was a prosecutor in Mexico. I assume he was prosecuting cartel members and his wife was beheaded and little girl thrown into a vat of acid. I mean, what's more yeah. horrific? That's that's it. Yeah. The thing is, we don't even know that that's true either. Josh Brolin he's using her as a pawn yeah the the whole time or or matt matt graver who works for the cia yes she's fbi he's cia but he at the beginning says he's uh, a consultant for the dod or something right right they're working with the department of uh it's a Department of Justice. So it's DOD, DOJ and DOD, the Department of Defense. It's a joint task force overseen by Josh Brolin's character, Matt Graver, and Alejandro. I do think that Alejandro's character is interesting because, you know, in the beginning, you, do, you just don't know what to make of him at all. But throughout the movie, you, you see him in different lights. You know, um, 
of course, when you find out what's done to his family, you, you have a lot of sympathy for him. And he seems to also sort of be taking care of Kate at times. And when he comes in and rescues yes. her, when she's being attacked, and then he, the next day, you know, how's your neck? And, you know, they seem like they're almost forming a little bit of a friendship. Um, but then in the end, after she finds out who he works for, you know, when he comes to see her at her apartment, you know, he's sitting in shadow and she's clearly um, uncomfortable. And then you, he seems a little more sinister than when he pulls that gun on her. You yeah. Know? So it's a lot of back and forth with how you view him and really a lot of characters in the movie and just the, the idea of just the war on drugs overall. He's got something of an arc going on. Let's see if we can work through this. What do you think about this? When he shoots her from the hip, even like twice in the bulletproof vest, and then he points the gun in her face and he says, don't ever point a weapon at me again. Get back up there and go do whatever. She points a weapon at him again at the end. Mm -hmm. And his response is not what you would think his response would be after the scene that I just mentioned. He just turns around and faces her full on. Do you think that he felt like she can shoot me now because I'm done? I've, I've, I've finished doing what I wanted to. Or was he just sure that she wouldn't? I think he was sure that she wouldn't. I think that he feels like he knows what she is struggling with because he probably struggled with it at one point, too. And I think that in the end, they really are on the same side. You know, they're, they're going after the same people. There's yeah. Two different ways about sure. how to do it. Like you said, he's just further along in his story yeah. than she is. Yeah. I think that's a good point. I feel like the boss at the end who Alejandro finally gets his vengeance on in a horrible way. Oh, that was such a powerful scene. It really was. And the build up to it. Oh. Uh, All that tension. That boss, I think, has more in common philosophically with Kate, even though they are complete polar opposites and on total opposite sides of she's sort of a law enforcement pawn in America. He's obviously just a a murderous, you know, head of a cartel, but they're both extremely interested in preserving the status quo. She has no interest in actually making a real difference. I think that she's more interested in giving her life purpose and meaning because she's really, really good at this one Mm -hmm. thing and apparently only this one thing, which is law enforcement. Because Uh when we see her step out of that, she's socially awkward. She's inept. Uh, Her dating life is a shambles. Right. Those are the two that are more, they're very interested in preserving the status quo. And it's, it's Alejandro who stands in stark opposition to both of their plans. Right. Yeah. And Josh, Josh, Matt, Matt's character. Yeah. Who, by the way, I love that character. There's just something about Josh Brolin. The guy's got charisma. Yeah. You know, something about him wearing flip flops and still being deferred to by these bureaucrats in three piece suits. I mean, you've seen a character like that before where it's just the laid back. Yeah. Flip flops, chewing gum, you know? Mm -hmm. Yeah. It's interesting. Um, Yeah. I mean, he and Alejandro are so different, you know, because, I mean, he's Alejandro's on a revenge mission, essentially. And what do you think is driving Josh Brolin's character? That's a great question. I don't know what's driving him. I think yeah. that he represents America's, the way we do things, mm-hmm. our foreign policy when it comes to this problem in particular. He's jovial. He's he's always kind of mm-hmm. just being a smart ass. He doesn't yeah. seem to be, to just look at the guy, you would think he's kind of the dude. He's sort of an F like a a CIA version of the dude, like some stoner archetype, but he's not, he cares intently about what he's doing. And I think that's pretty obvious through his dialogue and the fact that he, he just keeps her totally in the dark. He doesn't tell her anything that she needs Mm -hmm. to know. And she was a pawn the whole time. She was only there so that they could check a box on a form that says that local law enforcement was here. Therefore we're allowed to operate in this area. That's it. And I have a big question about that. Mm -hmm. Why do you think he picked her and not her partner? Her partner is also an attorney. So he thought that he would be asking more questions. Legal questions. Yeah. Yeah. Because immediately when when they they called them both in, they were Mm -hmm. both kind of up for the gig without realizing that they were both up for it. And Brolin asks, what'd that guy do beforehand? And the guy said, you know, law degree. He was like, nope, get her. Yeah. He just, it would have been a whole different movie (laughs) if they would have invited that guy along. And then... He asked her, you know, are you married in that initial meeting? Do you have a family? Kids. Why do you think he wanted to know that? It seems like, you know, you would think that he he might be thinking this is dangerous work. That's how I took it. But then the more I think about it, I I just 
I wonder if that's what his motivation was, or is he trying to figure out what kind of person she is? I don't know. I think that, I mean, really what he's trying to do is pick someone that won't make waves, right? Probably. That will just kind of sit back and watch. And also, do you think that's why he picked a female? I feel like there's a, there's some gender stuff going on in this film. Like something I didn't even realize the first time is that she's the only female that has lines in the movie, I believe. Is that right? Yeah. Oh, wow. Holy there shit. Are not, there are hardly any other females huh. that you see. And it's maybe like the wife of the cartel guy or like a maid or, you know, just a few other yeah. characters like that. But, um, and, you know, it's very much like, I think it's really trying to make it clear to you that this is like a boys game. You know, she's when she... From yes. the beginning, she's riding along. She's trying to get information. They're making a lot of like kind of dude jokes, you know, and stuff. And she's like really out of her element. Yeah, there's um, definitely which, gender stuff going on. Yeah. I don't know if you watched the supplementary stuff that's on the Blu-ray. The writer just flat out said, I, I made this character a woman specifically mm-hmm. because I just feel like a man would be more apt to just go with the flow and to not yeah. take that moral stand and to just kind of go, okay, well, this is how things are. So I'm just going to go with it. And he's yeah. like, I felt like a woman would be less likely, less inclined to go yeah. down that route. That's interesting. I don't know if there's anything, if there's any truth in that, but it, it I don't know, maybe it worked on a subconscious level. Cause I bought yeah. it. I thought she was great. She was great in this movie. And I hate that she's mm-hmm. not in the sequel. I actually had no intention of seeing the sequel, but I uh, just dug around a little bit. Same writer wrote this. And that oh, writer okay. is really good. I don't know if you've seen Hell or High Water. He wrote that also. Mm-hmm. And that TV show, uh, Yellowstone, that's getting a lot of uh, acclaim okay. right I've now. Heard of that. Yeah. He's big on the modern Western, apparently. Yeah, this yeah. is a modern Western in a way. It's 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 frontier stuff. Uh-huh. I, I tried to read a little bit about what other people said about the movie after I watched it. And I didn't come across like a ton um, of theories and things or comparisons, but I did see one that was interesting. They compared it to um, Apocalypse Now, which I thought was kind of interesting. I don't know if you... I skimmed over something like that this morning when I was mm-hmm. doing some last minute research. Kurtz and Kilgore are reflected in the characters of, uh, gosh, I, Alejandro I and, um, Brolin. Is it Brolin? Brolin yeah. Character. yeah. Yeah. And I guess I didn't really dig too deep into that, but what I just took from that surface level was that Brolin was sort of the, the kill gore, the, the yeah. guy that just sort of loves what he does right. and is yeah. sort of <laughs> like, kind of doesn't want the party to stop. Might be insane. Yeah. <laughs> One day this war is going to end. You know, yeah. I, I, I could kind of see Matt saying that. And and yeah, I mean, you're also like in that movie, you know, you're on a boat, you know, you're riding along for most of it, which I kind of felt like you are in this movie as well. Yeah, this movie's got a lot of uh, stuff going on in it that Villeneuve loves. I mentioned it, I think, in the last episode where we spoke about one of his movies, Enemy. He enjoys putting horrific stuff just outside the frame oh yeah or yeah. slowly revealing information the opening shot it goes from black to you know a fully lit beautiful day and it looks like the suburbs yeah. and then all these federal agents in tactical gear are clearly about to raid one of mm-hmm. the houses it's like just it was right outside the frame that that whole time and we didn't know and then there was the, the scene where they tortured Diaz's brother yeah. um, which again what you don't show is probably way more horrific than, right. than what they could have shot. They just showed like a shot of um, a shot of the drain or something like really mundane, like while well, that was happening. I, I was expecting blood to start going down the drain, but they didn't no, take it that yeah. far. Yeah, I feel like we should talk about Alejandro's um, interrogation techniques. Those were he's a really close stander. <laughs> he gets up in your personal space and like I didn't know what was going on at first. Yeah, and, I, and then I realized when he like, when oh, he, he stood there, here. he kicked that guy's legs apart and then stood yeah. right there. It's like, "Oh, he put his crotch right in that guy's face." Yeah. I'm sure it had something to do with waterboarding. He had that big jug of water that he brought in there with him yeah. too. Again, I think it was a smart decision to just not show yeah. us and just just yeah. kind of focus on something else, something mundane in mm-hmm. the room. You know, when I was talking about, you know, other things that I noticed on the second watch, I didn't uh, realize that she was, and I, I could be wrong, but I don't think I am, that she was the only female with the lines in the movie. I was also noticing how the only time you see a family depicted, it is on the Mexican side. There's talk of family, you know, like mm-hmm. um, Ted, I think was Shane from Walking Dead. I don't know the actor's name when he's being John Bernthal. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Yes. John Bernthal. He's he's there's mention of his daughter. And, you know, there's a lot about family in this and people doing things to protect their families. I noticed that, you know, in the opening scene and then the final scene, you know, you see 
this uh, cartel member, this police officer, um, his son, you know, wanting to play soccer and you're, you're seeing like their home life, you know, and you can relate to that. And then, you know, you see the head of the cartel having dinner al fresco with his family Mm -hmm. near the end. And it just seems like a normal, you know, family. And I I think that the reason that that was done is is so that you, it it makes you go back to questioning, you know, uh, who's the bad guy here, you know? Because there's really, I mean, if you were to show someone that scene, that last supper with that family, I mean, if you were to just show that scene without context, clearly Alejandro is evil. There's just no other word for what he did there. I mean, he murdered the guy's family right in front of him with ruthless efficiency. Oh, no. Yeah. I mean, I was just thinking about that scene. It's just such a good scene. and um, So much tension. Yeah. And also... I was just very shocked when he finally arrived and they're just out in the open having dinner and that I was like, oh, wow. I think that there's something there with any earlier in in the movie you saw, um, I think it's Manuel Diaz, his family. Mm -hmm. He's watching his kids swim and he pretty much lives in a glass house. Um, And then here, this head of the cartel is having dinner outside, just like out in the open. And it just Mm -hmm. is, um, you know, what is that trying to say? That Have these people gotten so comfortable that they feel untouchable? I mean, Juarez was depicted as a real, (laughs) I mean, just a pit. The mayor, when this movie came out, the mayor of Juarez wanted people to boycott the movie. Actually, it was like yeah. this. This movie makes the makes our our, our city seem like it's uh, just a war zone, and it hasn't been since 2010. It's been five whole years of relative peace <laughs> yeah. where we haven't had <laughs> mutilated bodies strung up off of. Uh, yeah, brutal. and you know, I was really in the dark on a lot of that stuff. I mean, I guess I had just not really. And when I watched the movie the first time, I was with my husband. I'm like, is that real? Did they really do that? Like, is that really what it's like? You know? And he's like, yeah. I mean, they like to hang people from overpasses. I mean, yeah, they do that. Kind of stuff. I'm just like, wow, I had, I, I'm kind of embarrassed. I like just had no idea. You want to talk about the score a little bit? Did you notice the score? Um, because this guy is uh, great at kind of hiding it and just sort of yeah. using it to ramp up the tension. Uh, Johan Johansson, I think is how you pronounce the composer's name. He uh, worked on Prisoners as well. And then after this arrival, before he passed away in 2018, he does a lot of, I think Villeneuve works closely with these composers and tells them, I want the sounds that are in the scene to blend into the movie so that you're not quite sure if you're that shot with the helicopter, the score comes in and it blends perfectly with those propeller blades. The score doesn't stand out to me. Like on second watch, I tried to pay more attention to it. And I, it felt like, you know, at times it was like a slow, sinister march almost. Mm-hmm. And I also thought that it doesn't stand out a lot because it is similar to the sounds like blends in with a helicopter. The sounds you might hear when you're riding inside a car, just like the thuds, you know, mm-hmm. rhythmic kind of thuds. Now they definitely took inspiration from John Williams's Jaws. They build tension with that, but it, it plays a little bit faster. It's not a total knockoff, but you can tell that they, they were heavily influenced by that. With that in mind, on my third viewing, I noticed that the drums didn't really come in until violence started up. Uh, there were no drums. It's all build up, build up, build up. Yeah. And then when the drums come in, that's when that's when you get violence. Let's talk about Silvio, because I want to get to what you think about what the ending means. I mean, that final, that little sequence that I just talked about. Mm -hmm. Silvio is the Mexican police officer who's really one of Diaz's mules. We don't get a whole lot of backstory on him, but we keep seeing him throughout the movie. And I kept the first time I watched, I was like, why do we keep getting all this stuff? Mm -hmm. Why are we getting stuff with this guy? He has nothing to do with anything. Do you think that Silvio was truly a quote unquote bad cop? Or was he just a guy who wanted to keep his family safe? And the best way to do that is to take drug money from the local cartel when they tell you that you have to. Because, again, they'll kill your family. I think it was the latter. I got the impression that he was a good guy. Yeah. And, you know, like, you know, he went and played soccer with his son and he uh, his son tried to touch his gun at one point. He was very like, no, I I thought that was the tell. 
Yeah. Yeah. I, it's kind of like, I don't want you to, to get involved in this. I don't want you to ever, this is all just to protect you guys. Kind of is what, how I took it. Yeah. That's exactly how I took it too. And I, and it all came from that. If I didn't have that one moment with the little boy touching his gun, his demeanor, he was uh, an attentive, loving dad, but the moment his son reached for his rifle, he, he changed on a dime. Yeah. It's like, no. Like he did not want that kid getting involved in that life at all. And I think that's why, you know, we were only shown the families in auras is probably just to, you know, make you question, you know, or think, you know, hey, maybe they aren't so different from us. I found that Silvio was actually kind of a nice, I don't know if it was necessary, but it just felt like extra sauce in the movie. It was a counterbalance to Kate. Kate, they, they were sort of two sides of, of the same coin. They're both local law enforcement on their respective sides of the border. And they're both pawns. They're both right. being manipulated by the higher ups to their own purposes. Also something that kind of, there's sort of a mirror image thing going on. Alejandro shoots both of them with absolutely no hesitation. Yeah. But he shows mercy to Kate. He hits her in her, her body armor on purpose. He didn't bother with that. He just callously, mm -hmm. he murders Sylvia. I was a little bit surprised by that. Me too. But I think that was the kind of the whole point. It's like, let's let's build up this character. Let's introduce him. Let's show him. Let's show the, the audience his, his family life, kind of get some sympathy. And then you realize that he's just one of how many people were shot down like that. And he could have been all of those people, all of those people, the people that died in that awesome shootout in the traffic jam. Oh, yeah. They all had families too, you know, and maybe mm -hmm. they weren't quote unquote bad guys so much as they were people who, if I don't do this, the cartel is going to do horrible things to my family. So I kind of mm -hmm. have to, when I watch this again, that sequence at the border, when they're in the traffic jam, that is just the best set piece in this movie. It's so yeah. good. So tense. It beats a high oh, yeah. speed chase all to hell. Yeah, you're right. And they're just sitting still in traffic and it's more nerve wracking than it is it's more exciting. Action. Yeah. And then when bullets fly, it lasts all of three seconds and then it's over, much mm -hmm. like it probably would be in real life, I, I suppose. Yeah. And all those guys and even the cop that Kate has to kill to save her own life, that guy maybe had a family. You know, the camera yeah. could have been on him. We could have been going back and checking in on his family the whole time instead of Silvio's. He's just one mm -hmm. of many, quote unquote, pawns or, or henchmen that, that get right. callously killed in this movie. And I think that Silvio is there to sort of ground us. Like these aren't mm -hmm. just endless henchmen. These are actual yes. people that have family lives and they maybe don't want to be doing what they're doing, but they kind of have to, to protect their families. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. I want you to question that. Just like, you know, maybe the bigger question is war and war in general. You know, I mean, if you really think about it, you know, this is something of a war movie. Yeah. A and it is, a, it is a war. Yeah. The car loads of guys on, in that, that sequence in the traffic jam, there's two car loads, two sedans full of, of gangster cartel guys. They realize that they're outgunned and outnumbered and that they're flanked and that there's just absolutely no way they're going to survive this. But they draw their guns anyway. And the third time I watched this, I started watching it with that lens like that guy does not want to do this. They're, they're not just yeah. like drugged up lunatics. They're probably yeah. thinking if I don't make I'm the dead. effort I'm dead anyway yeah. my my son's dead not only yeah. am i dead but my daughter is dead too yeah and that right. kind of puts a whole new light on this yeah they're bad guys and they're doing bad stuff they kind of have to do you think that um i think his name was ted the cop that befriended her at the bar do you think it was a similar situation for him he was trying to protect his yeah daughter didn't he mention his daughter yeah. or something yeah i guess i'm i don't know enough about it to know like how do these people like end up getting involved in these situations? Is it greed at some point and then it turns into something else? Or is it a lot of the times like they don't have a choice? I suppose it depends on where you are, first off, because if you're in Juarez, at the height of the cartel violence, they were yeah. just brazenly in public, killing people, stringing people up, mutilating people, assassinating police chiefs, mayors. They were just brazen. In a situation like that, it's more like I have to help these people or that's it for my family. But on this side of the border, it's probably a little more like here's some money. Yeah, that's what I was thinking. And that's kind of the lure. And then, of course, the threat of, you know, hurting yeah. one's family is always present. So there are two different motivations, possibly, depending on whether you're over there or here. And it's a lot easier to take a big, uh, big stack of cash when you know that your daughter is also going to be safe, too. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I mean, it's it's easy to say that you've got morals and that you're not going to be a dirty cop until someone threatens your kid. 
Right. Yeah, this movie just really languishes in the whole moral ambiguity of it all. And, yeah. and this is the perfect subject matter to discuss that in because there are no clear good guys or bad guys. You know, I just thought of one motivating factor. You asked about Matt's motivation earlier, mm-hmm. and I think the closest we ever got to that was um, I've got his quote here. He tells Kate, until someone until figures somebody out a way finds to a way to convince 20% of the population to stop snorting and smoking that shit. Order is the best we can hope for. Order is the best that we can hope for. Yeah. He seems like an idealist in a grand scheme of things kind of a guy. Mm -hmm. Whereas Kate seems to be more of an idealist on a more of a microcosmic level, Mm -hmm. sort of where the rubber meets the road. Yeah, I could see that. You know, we haven't talked much about her partner, uh, Reggie, uh, and you're talking about the moral ambiguity. Yeah, Daniel um, uh, Kaluuya, I think Uh, Yeah, pronounce his name. Really Uh, good actor. I don't know if you were like me, but at some point in the movie, I started thinking he was friendly with a cartel. Oh, wow. Uh, it's because I think, well, you know, you you start kind of questioning everyone at some point. And um, it was after he introduced her to that um, to top friend at the bar. Yeah. You know, earlier she said, why are we here? Or do you come, you know, like, where are we? Sort of like he picked the bar and then, oh, his friend just happened to be there. And he happened to be, he happened to be building up to her like, oh, you really need to get back out there and date. And I thought that for sure that was going to be a twist and it wasn't. And I was like, wow, really surprised by that. He just seems like such a good, likable guy that uh, if he would have, that would have been totally out of like, oh God, I didn't see that coming at all. And then I also started to think that they were aware of that because they, you know, fo- you know, let uh, her go to this bar and they followed her because they knew what was going to happen. But uh, I started thinking that uh, Matt and Alejandro were um, aware that he was involved and that's why they let him come along because they were going to feed him misinformation or something. Because one right. thing I didn't, wasn't sure about was they didn't want him on the task force but yet they let him like come along yeah so much and let him know all this information that i was like kind of confused as to why they would do that the same here and i don't know if that's just law enforcement culture where they would just allow someone to just i can't imagine that that's accurate but they were totally fine with him like she was like why don't you come with me for moral support and he goes okay i mean it wasn't spelled out like that in dialogue but that's essentially what it boiled down to and they were okay with it Mm -hmm. i don't know (laughs) <laughs> and also he was able, to, and this may go back to like kind of the gender thing. I don't know, but um, he was like, wait, we need some answers, you know? And she's like, I don't have any for you. And he's like, well, let's get some. And then he called them over and asked them what they were doing. And they immediately told him and he's like, okay, <laughs> it wasn't as easy for her to get that info from them. But I was a little bit surprised that they were letting him in on so much when they didn't really want his type around, you know, like a lawyer or someone that would be asking questions. They established immediately that they didn't want him around and, or they didn't, they were more interested in her and not him. And it was pretty heavily implied that it was because he was an attorney too, but Mm -hmm. they let him tag along. I don't, I don't know. I'm not sure what that was about. That's why I thought there was some, and and then I thought maybe it wanted you, maybe the movie was supposed to make Mm -hmm. you question him too at some point. And then it'd be like, "Uh uh-uh, that's not really what this is. Right. I I don't know. (laughs) <laughs> this is one that keeps you kind of guessing and depending on your moral perspective, you're going to kind of mm-hmm. rally behind different characters. The part of me that likes a good action movie really was rooting for Alejandro. But if we were to just take all of this stuff and apply it to the real world, I don't know if I can root for a guy like that. Yeah, maybe. I, I, again, I, when I say I don't know, I, I'm, I literally mean I'm really not sure. That's a I big love, moral question. Yeah. And I love movies and uh, shows that deal with that. I think about Breaking Bad. It's like one of my favorite um, mm-hmm. TV shows. I feel like we're getting close to the end here. Do you have anything that you wanted to talk about in particular that we haven't hit? Um, I've got a couple of little things that uh, that were pointed out to me that I wanted, I wanted to just yeah. mention these. I was not smart enough to catch them, but they were pointed out to me. And sure enough, they were right there. A lot of the time when Kate is faced with a moral question, there's an American flag in the shot somewhere with Kate. Oh, wow. Almost every time. When they're in that cowboy bar before mm-hmm. Ted walks up, there's one hanging up on the wall right back there. When we get that wide shot where she and uh, and Matt are yelling at each other and he's saying, we're shaking the tree. We're just trying to stir shit up and you just need yeah. to sponge all this up. You've got that flag flying in the background. Then when she's talking to the bureaucrats, the guy that said, you know, mm-hmm. we prosecuted all these people last year. Did you flag right there? There's flags, American wow. flags somewhere in the background. Yeah, I, I didn't notice that. Um... I thought you were going to say whenever she's faced with a moral dilemma, she reaches for a cigarette. 
I think she did that too, but I think that was just stress. Yeah. I want to talk about that opening shot too, or not, not the opening shot, but um, right at the beginning when Kate and Reggie and their team are going to the safe house and they're in their little mm-hmm. personnel carrier. It's a really, really dark. And we get these close-ups of her face. It's when we first mm-hmm. meet her, there's these shafts of light that keep shining into the, and passing over her face. I'm pretty sure that's intentional, like saying, yeah. okay, this is going to get dark, but here's our one ray of light right here. That's how we're introduced to her. Yeah, I, I noticed other scenes like that, too, um, with light coming through curtains. And even in the end on the balcony, when she's standing on the balcony, there's a curtain and you can kind of see through it and light coming in. And that's something I didn't talk about when we discussed that balcony scene, when she points the gun at him. They were just inside. And like I mentioned earlier, she was she had the big white bear apartment wall behind her and he was sitting in shadow but then when she goes outside she's more gray there's like this grayish cast Mm -hmm. in the air and she's she's gone gray a little bit and when we cut to him he's the one that's got white behind him and he's more Mm -hmm. silhouetted almost i thought that was a really nice touch i think and i'm sure they did that on purpose i mean this is roger deakins we're talking about yeah. The, the, the guy understands how to communicate things to people. And even if we don't look at it and consciously think the lighting here is to symbolize maybe she's not light after all. She might be leaning more towards his methodology and philosophy. Your brain is noticing that stuff, even if you're yeah. not consciously oh, yeah, thinking totally. it. Yeah, there's a lot. There was a lot with that with light and dark and in shadow and uh, mm-hmm. even just like the opacity of things or seeing through the curtain or like the, the glass houses or the glass in the the meeting that they were having in the beginning. And it was like, uh, you know, soundproof though. You, you could see in and, you know, they're kind of trying to figure out what they're discussing mm-hmm. about whether they did things by the book or not. And, you know, it, it, maybe it's supposed to be like this facade or this illusion of transparency, but there's, uh, there are always things that are, you know, hidden just like, you know, the, the bodies in the wall in the beginning. And I don't yeah, know. Man, I felt like we were just in full on horror movie mode yeah. right at the beginning of the movie. Like, Oh my God. Definitely got my attention. Sure. Yeah. And you're totally right. I think about first glance, this movie isn't very, I don't know. I mean, it's a lot of beige. It's a lot of, you know, a lot of neutral colors, but yeah, I mean like whether you, whether it jumps out at you or not, it is sort of just, you know, seeping into your subconscious throughout, even just like the, the score and how it doesn't really stand out. Yeah. A lot. It sort of blends Um, in and builds tension subliminally Mm -hmm. almost i think one of my favorite shots was uh near the end when um it it was like nightfall they're going into the tunnel and just seeing you know the sun go down and the horizon and they just sort of slowly sink into the horizon you know like they're just these shadowy figures and then they just sink down and then it goes and i read a little bit about this um so I was curious about the night vision shots. I hadn't really seen anything quite like that before. And it said that uh, Deacons wanted to shoot it with night vision. And he got, they, they got a camera made by some company that um, makes cameras for scientific studies or something. I don't know. So that was like fully shot in complete darkness, I think. Deacons, man. I, I hope he works with Villeneuve forever and ever. Yeah. Like the, them and, and the Coens. He does great on their mm-hmm. movies, too. The guy just is a wonderful filmmaker. I looked up like his IMDb or mm-hmm. something, and I'm just like, it was just never ending credits. Like, how, how does he have the time? Just <laughs> classics all, all the way down. Yeah. He gets to pick who he works with. Yeah. I don't think Villeneuve really had made much of a name for himself when he decided, I'm going to uh, shoot prisoners for this guy. Jill, I think we've wrapped it up. Do you want to plug anything? You're working on new music, right? Uh, I am working on new music. Um, it's, uh, I had a baby earlier this year, so it's been a slow process. Sure. But yeah, uh, I am hopefully going to play some shows again next year. Okay. I really like your record, <laughs> by the way. Oh, thanks. Yeah. The last show we played um, was Spewfest, the February, yeah, February 2020, right before wow. everything got shut down. So yeah, that's hard, kind of hard to believe. But yeah, I did release an album right before the pandemic. If people want to check it out, it's still there on Bandcamp. Thank you so much for joining me, Jill. I appreciate Thank your time you. this morning. I know you've got stuff to do. I'll let you get to it. Thanks for having me. Take care. And that's the talk. Check out Jill's music that she releases under the name Fetching Pails. You can find it pretty much everywhere music streams. She's on YouTube too, of course, and on Instagram at Fetching Pails. And definitely check out her YouTube account. You'll find a few music videos from Telekinesis for Beginners, all three of which were directed by Jill. 
I'd like to thank Jill Townsend and, of course, Will Fox, Michael Eads, and Ross Warner. Filmography Club can be found on Instagram at filmography underscore club underscore podcast. Filmography Club is produced by the always hardworking folks that we own this town. I'm Jason Cavanis. This is Filmography Club. And as always, thanks for listening. <laughs>